Hello, we're going to start in just a few seconds here. We're waiting for a few more people to join. Uh, uh, welcome to today's uh, QIF presentation. And uh, we will, we, we want to bring up the next slide and we'll just go through housekeeping while we're waiting for people to join us. Uh, thank you. So today um, you will be, uh, have the opportunity to submit questions. We're going to have everybody on mute during the presentation and uh, then we'll have a Q&A section at the end. Um, please uh, note, uh, like on our presentation, uh, on our PowerPoint slide that we have a, there's a, a box on the, the GoToWebinar for questions. Please enter your questions. And as I said, we will uh, go through them uh, one by one as, as we uh, go through it. And I just, so you don't have to take cop copious notes, uh, we will be uh, emailing you tomorrow a link to this uh, presentation so you can have it uh, for your review. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, Jennifer. She is our speaker today, and, and really the, today's presentation is What is QIF? Um, I just want to remind everybody that next month we'll be talking about. Uh, 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 a user experience between uh, uh, Capvidia and uh, uh, Snyder Electronics about different user experiences with QIF. And just to remind you all, this is, we called this a coffee chat because we wanted a small informal conversation. It will address uh, vendors who are solving QIF, using QIF to solve problems. And it really is about users and their journey on using QIF and things that they have seen that works and doesn't work. So uh, there'll be a whole series uh, through the end of the year. Uh, so I encourage you to go to the qifstandards.org website to learn more uh, about the different uh, presentations and uh, sign up uh, whenever you, for anyone that you like. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jennifer. Cool. Thanks, Ray. Um, I do have my coffee. <laughs> so um, and, and I am excited to have a chat with folks here. Uh, so hopefully I'll give you some introductory information to QIF if you're new to it. And um, I, I would like to say I'm a Digital Metrology Standards Consortium board member as well, along with, with Ray Stahl. And um, I'm happy to be here presenting to you guys today. So I want to start with the background on the Digital Metrology Standards Consortium. And that is the uh, organization that um, develops QIF. So our mission at the DMSC is to provide standardized interoperable data framework for manufacturing. And we do that by creating quality standards that impact the digital thread through digital metrology and interoperability. So, Keep the future in mind. Um, we'll come back to where we are today in the future, but I want to roll you all the way back to 1986. So uh, rainbows in the A-team. Uh, and that marks uh, the inception of the DMSC, where in 1986, the DMSC started their standardization work on DMIS. And DMIS stands for Dimensional Measuring Interface Standard. And you can see that DMIS has evolved uh, up until 2011 which marks a turning point for the DMSC and, and really the state of technology. So in 2011, we're starting to see 3D digital CAD models and model-based definition on the rise. And the DMSC wanted to evolve to keep up with the times and QIF was born. So QIF is the quality information framework. And just like DMIS, it has also evolved since 2011. And we now have QIF 3.0 that has been officially adopted uh, by ISO. So it took a few years for the ISO review process because this is the way standards roll. Um, but through hard work and dedication in July of 2020, right smack in the middle of the pandemic, uh, ISO approved and harvested QIF 3.0 into the TC184. SC4 Working Group 15, uh, which focuses on digital manufacturing. So this was a big deal. 
And um, one of the ISO requests in the process was to understand the mapping between STEP 242 and QIF. So that work is underway and it's a pretty big effort. Um, so we're done with the history of the DMSC and looking forward to the future of the DMSC. There are two active working groups uh, going on today that are two very valuable next steps for digital metrology. The first one is model-based characteristics, and the second one is non-contact metrology. So the model-based characteristics working group is defining nomenclature, definitions, symbols, data structures, and practices for product process and service definition. And it also includes model-based definition with persistent identification. The non-contact metrology working group is busy defining non-contact measurement workflows using QIF as the foundation for those workflows. Uh, so Ray, we are gonna take a quick poll. Could you share yes. that? And Jennifer, we had a slight technical glitch here. I had tested it and it didn't reset, but um, if people could just respond back in the uh, chat, which, which category you're in, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll tally it on the side and, and come back to it. But the, here's the question, you know, um, you, are you using uh, QIF today in your uh, product activities, uh, doing demos to achieve digital metrology capabilities, just starting to test QIF to check it out, uh, uh, listening and learning about QIF. I've never heard of QIF. It's my very first exposure. So if you could just take a minute and write a quick response back, uh, that'd be great. I'll tally these and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back as soon as I get a few numbers. And so Jennifer, I'm gonna give it back to you. Sure. Yeah, and, and that was pretty, it was pretty much a, a spectrum of, you know, this is the very first time uh, exactly. You've ever heard of QIF all the way to, yep, QIF is how we're doing things in production today and we're using um, everything it has to offer for digital metrology and maybe even some manufacturing activities. So I, I have very few using it today. I have a number listening and learning, uh, or sort of just kind of getting involved. So we're, we're, in a, we're across the spectrum. Okay, good. Well, um, this next section is for those listening and learning. Uh, I wanted to give you some background if you're unfamiliar with what QIF is, kind of kind of start from the beginning to uh, make sure you understand uh, the pieces. So why? The world needs a standard for digital metrology. And we've heard from manufacturers and their suppliers that they want common interfaces, interoperability, persistent traceability throughout the design to manufacture process and a way to communicate those rules and those, uh, those results back, so a feedback loop. So the way we do that is through a neutral digital file format that requires minimal software development, and this is for the software vendors, and it is enabled by XML schemas. What it is, is a way to increase your 3D data interoperability. And, and this is just a big deal and a hot uh, topic these days um, for, for the world economy. So uh, you've likely heard the term digital thread or digital twin, and these are really big concepts that describe our collective vision to connect together digital data. So industry 4.0, model-based enterprise, what we're seeing in this digital data is the underlying flow of data through all business activities. And that's pretty big scope. So if we hone in now on how 3D data flows through the digital thread, uh, then the functional areas that we use 3D data in today are engineering, manufacturing, quality, through the supply chain, and in analysis. So these are you know, they're like, there's so many, many 3D data sets you can use across the life cycle and of any part. Um, and they vary for industry and tool suite. And what QIF um, does is enable that digital thread and persistent 
uh, characteristic identification all the way through these functionalities. So I have actually personally used QIF and the software that supports it to move 3D metrology data from engineering through manufacturing, through quality, through the supply chain, um, and through analysis. So this, this is the opportunity that we have um, to build on. So going to the next step um, of what QIF is, I want to talk about the word ontology. Ontology and in information science is the representation of entities, ideas, and events, along with their properties and relations, according to a system of categories. Ontology is a formal naming and definition of the types, properties, and interrelationships of the entities that fundamentally exist for a particular domain. And so why do we even care about ontology? Because QIF at its core is a feature-based and characteristic-centered ontology for manufacturing data that includes fabrication and inspection. And using XML that is semantically linked MBD, QIF is a standard integrated information model for the efficient exchange of data between software and equipment modules for discrete product measurement. So most importantly, it's an official American and ISO adopted standard. So this is what we like to call the donut. Uh, this describes the framework of standards that exist within QIF today. And if you think of these as containers for the data rather than the processes, um, then that's kind of a good um, mindset to, to stay in. So we really rely on the software and hardware vendors that are implementing QIF to create the processes which use these containers and the ontology. So as an example um, uh, of how we impact the digital thread, um, in an automated system, you need to plan your inspection. And each segment of the framework has schemas to provide the plan to inspect and store the results. So there are rules about how to put things in and out of those containers that I showed you in that donut. And QIF facilitates workflows that enable quality professionals to work through their quality processes. So this is an extension of plan, do, check, act. So an example QIF workflow is um, gonna be pretty illustrative. So let me walk you through this. So in step one, you search the PMI or product manufacturing information that's applied to the QIF model-based definition model, and identify the necessary measurement tasks. Then this list of tasks becomes the bill of characteristics. Now in step two, using a set of measurement rules and a list of avail available measurement resources, we assign measurement resources to measurement tasks. In step three, we generate a DEMIS inspection program for the high level plan for any CMM measurement tasks that have been assigned. And that's right, QIF and DEMIS actually interoperate together uh, so we can assist the transition of the older standards to the newer standards. And in step four, we evaluate the point cloud data from a coordinate measurement machine or other digital measurement equipment against each measurement requirement. And then finally, in step five, we carry out statistical analysis of a set of measurement results. And these results provide fertile opportunities for data mining. Um, and that's the overview of kind of the opportunity that you can uh, get to with QIF. Uh, so get, diving down a little bit deeper, looking at the fundamental constructs behind QIF, is a feature ontology and relationships to the characteristics. So shown on the screen here is an example of the features. And here are examples of the characteristics that are associated to those features. Not an inclusive list, but to illustrate uh, the kinds of relationships that are connected with the standard. Um, now, I've said the words persistent 
and I've said the words um, unique identifier across the digital um, thread landscape. This Cupid, this QIF persistent identifier, is the enabler for traceability for 3D metrology data as it moves through that, that donut framework. And we attach this unique identifier to every characteristic and then it lives with that characteristic as the data travels across. So it can move from QIF MBD into QIF plans, into QIF resources, into QIF rules, into DEMIS, into QIF results, and finally into QIF statistics. And we're really starting to create a great feedback loop for um, metrology results. Here's an example of that Cupid in action. Uh, that Cupid is uh, describing this surface profile in this uh, QIF MBD model. So we at the DMSC really think that QIF impacts the digital thread with quality, and we hope you do too. Um, I would like to take a brief note and talk about how QIF works for non ASME GDNT, because most of my examples I'll show up as uh, ASME GDNT. Um, the container is the same, whether you're using ASME or you're using ISO GPS, family of standards, or if you're even using a JADA GGTT. Um, and the, there are details for tool implementers to navigate to implement one or the other. Um, and as, as a note, the DMSC actually has a member that's tested ISO GPS models uh, with some of the uh, software that does implement QIF. And um, they've noticed a couple of impediments and they're working with that tool vendor um, to kind of test and figure out what that is. Don't really know yet, based on those testing results, if the impediment is from the QIF schema or if it's with the tool implementation. But that work is underway, so that's great to know that um, we're testing with not only ASME, GDNT, but also ISO GPS. So we wanna let you know that the DMSC is committed to a global standard, and we'll work with you to extend the standard to include your geometric tolerancing needs. Uh, and our active tool vendor members are also working solutions to accommodate both ANSI and ISO standards. So, got a video for you and wanted to provide an illustration of the interoperability um, from, in this case, a CREO MBD model into a SOLIDWORKS um, uh, model and then out to a CMM program and all of this using QIF. So <clears throat> what you're seeing on the screen is that uh, Turbine Airfoil model. It was exported from Creo into a QIF model and then imported into SOLIDWORKS. And then what's happening here is uh, really with a click of a button, which is a big deal, um, it's taking those uh, surface profile uh, characteristics that were identified in the CREO MBD and its path planning for the CMM. So the nice thing um, here for quality professionals is they can perform CMM programming and simulate the probe tool path in we see about an 80% time savings. Roughly, it takes about eight hours for a typical part to build that CMM program, and, and we're seeing that in much le less time. So big time savings there. Uh, and so if we, after that CMM step, the next step is to collect the results and then feed it back and do statistical analysis. So what we see here is that bill of characteristics, the results for several part numbers, or for, I'm sorry, for several serial numbers, all collected here, and then the analysis can begin. So that's an example of that uh, unique identifier persisting the traceability of the data. Okay, I've got a couple more detailed workflows for you um, after kind of teasing you with some real world examples. 
Um, this is an overview of a quality workflow. And the blue boxes represent the key actions needed to develop and execute an inspection plan for a specific part. The red edged boxes represent the QIF sections uh, of their donut that address specific actions needed for part inspection and reporting. And so these are major steps that need to occur to complete a part inspection and reporting results. And so keep this baseline workflow in mind as I step you through the next set of slides where I'm going to show per particular workflows for particular work uh, use cases. Uh, all right, this example is a use case where a, an OEM developer design organization hands off data to a supplier. And this is one of the mid value propositions for QIF. Uh, there are very, very clear benefits of using QIF for the exchange of quality information, and especially from a large organization to a, supply, uh, a supplier. So in this case, the OEM would provide the suppliers with a QAF model, which includes the product model and the product manufacturing information. And they would include a QIF plan, which defines the critical measurements needed and how the inspection of the parts should be performed. Now on the supplier side, they receive a complete product model, which believe me is sometimes an issue, and the product manufacturing information, like the GD&T and the proposed quality plan. So this is a straightforward data exchange that eliminates time and increases accuracy during quoting or bidding. Um, I've personally seen time savings in uh, the quoting and bidding process of about 70%. So the supplier then uh, generates a QIF plan and rules for the inspection operation for the measurement plan and then allows the supplier to create the inspection plan from their for their CMNs. And then the QIF results provides the supplier and the OEM or the original designer with pass-fail uh, result criteria. And then QIF results can move into QIF statistics, allow the, both the supplier and the OEM to analyze and report quality data. So we now have a big feedback loop of exact and accurate data within um, that engineering to supplier handoff um which there is a lot of room for opportunity for time savings in that uh, manual handoff today and so this does a lot of uh, automation in that process okay so the next use case is um, a supplier specific inspection plan so here the oem would provide the supplier with the qif model the qif plan and also the rules the qif rules so when we add in the rules to pass off to the supplier, that provides the OEM with more control than the prior use case. And I've seen it both ways. Some uh, engineering organizations want complete control, and so they include these kind of rules. Some do not. And it just depends on how your operation works. But the framework works the same for both scenarios. Okay, and, and the last use case that I have to talk to you about today is on fabrication. In this use case, the QIF is within your own company, in your own organization. No supplier is involved in the process. The use of QIF then eliminates the need to convert files from one application to another in the various stages of the work process. Regardless of the fact if you're a Creo design house, you still may have SolidWorks on the floor seen it happen all over the place. It's just kind of a reality. So another key feature of QIF is that that Cupid, that unique identifier, enables traceability of various files created through the work process to be linked to the QIF MDD, which allows analysis of the design to fabrication. Therefore, they're able to learn the impact of the design intent and the impact of fabrication decisions made throughout the process. Um, and this was really a big aha moment for me because once I learned about QIF as a design engineer, because that's my background, I realized I could gain a much greater insight into my designs by really understanding the quality processes and results um, 
and it's just it's just a background and experience base that didn't have it as a designer. So now having uh, the knowledge, the data, uh, the information about quality um, and inspection, and 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 really what's supposed to be checked, uh, really helps me be a better designer. Well, because QIF is now an ISO standard, um, we are now impacting the digital thread with quality, not only in the US, but now also globally. Um, and so I hope I've given you a little bit of a teaser if you're new to kind of figure out um, what kind of uh, benefit QIF could bring to you. And we're gonna take your questions soon. Uh, give you a little bit of information with some resources uh, if you want to find out a little bit more. Uh, as Ray said, you're going to get these slides, but you can always just pick up your phone and grab that QR code if you like, and it'll take you right to um, where we live on the web. Um, you can find our active members, information tutorials, uh, and of course, to download the standard, you can uh, get, us, get us on the web as well. And you'll find this presentation posted on the website and on the website in upcoming weeks. Uh, there's also an online hub uh, for the community through GitHub, and we'd love to connect with you there as well. And then my last set of resources here, we are always accepting new memberships. So please ask me questions about DMSC membership or, or any of our active members. Uh, scan these QR codes to access the details yourself. Uh, there is a, an application there. You can just fill that out and send it in. And if you're not an active member, you are invited to the next um, or any DMSC membership meeting. Our next one is um, uh, it's actually May 20th, I believe. Yes. Got a typo on the slide here. Uh, May 20th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And hopefully that date's right, and, and Ray and Mark are checking that. I'm checking it right now for you. Okay. It's it's actually going to be uh, May 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Okay. Well, the scan is right, and it takes you to the website with the right data. So there you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to me um, and providing me the opportunity to speak to you about QIF. Um, I'm. Uh, CEO and founder of Action Engineering, and we're an active uh, QIF uh, um, member, as well as serve on the board. Um, and the uh, the product characteristics um, uh, working group is is near and dear to our heart, and we're doing a lot of work in that area as well. So uh, I am ready for questions, Ray. Yes, yes. So we have a few already, uh, and, and please, if you haven't already, please uh, at, submit your questions in the Q and A uh, section. Uh, the first one, uh, Jennifer, is the Q. Uh, this was um, the QIF Pi starts with the QIF MBD. Which software can generate QIF MBD? Yeah, I'll go back to our donut here. <clears throat> um, the software with, that we use today is uh, CapVidia MBD. Vidia is the software that we use, and we use it in SolidWorks Creo and um, in NX, and it's. Uh, it's just a plugin right inside the software and you click create QIF and it creates QIF file. Right. It's a QIF file created. Yes. Yeah. And Ray and Mark, do you have do you have any other inputs on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I believe Elysium's coming on, but the, right now CapVidia has been the leading provider of uh, of QIF models. Uh, so right. there are some, especially on Katia, I think the Elysium's a little uh, is another option. Oh, great. So, yeah. So the next question, uh, how do you attain a certified QA, QAF model? Well, certification. Challenging is a, question. Yeah, no, I mean, certification is a really good question. And this is one of the things that comes up with all digital data, all MBD data, um, is, the, is the challenge of verifying and validating and making sure the humans trust the QD data. Um, because that's we've got a whole lot of entrenched embedded processes around trusting 2D drawings, um, and we spend a lot of effort and labor costs on that trust cycle with 2D drawings. So what we want to do is maintain the trust of the 3D data 
um, and then report it out in some kind of certificate. Um, so you, me you mentioned Elysium um, and Capvidia uh, have verification um, comparison tools where they compare the source MBD with the output derivative file. And that could be anything, but in this case, we're talking, you know, Creo to QAF. Right. So you want to run that comparison, see how they compare, and then spit out a report that says you pass or you fail, or hey, human, I need help. There's something wrong here. So those those certification reports are very very important to pass along with uh, derivative um, information. I am aware of a company that's been doing that validation for a very long time, and they did it for so many data sets. They finally went. We don't really need to run this anymore because we completely trust that the translation process is sound. Right. So that happens as well. Okay, next question. Jennifer, where typically does the QIF as measured data get pooled for design analysis, for example? Did you say pooled? Pooled. Pooled, okay. All right, pooled. I like it. Um, kind of like a data lake. Um, yeah, good question. So let me go back to um, one slide that probably best illustrates. Um, so right, right, whoops, right now, um, you can imagine it, really any spreadsheet um, can collect those measurement results. Um, what you see here is I've got the requirement listed on the left, and then these uh, values over here are different serial numbers of that same part. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, different, different. serial numbers of so four different parts being measured four different ways. And so that's the analysis that's being collected. Um, and then you can then run statistical analysis um, uh, it, with software like um, Codem does this, right, Ray? Right. To, to, to analyze the results compared against the requirements and give you that, that variation um, right. result. Right. I, I think the, the key here is that, you know, it's the, it's the QIF Cupid, it's the unique identifier tag that gets associated with individual measured files that um, the, the pool, it could be anywhere architecturally, it's the query to be able to find those and associate it back into, for example, this present pre presentation here. So there's not like a specific location, it's, we, it's, right. it's more like a, a search and you find the ID tag and then you go, okay, I want that measured data, bring it into this this analysis tool, which in this case was, was, uh, that uh, Jennifer's demonstrating. So um, it's very flexible. That's the benefit, right? It's think more web, web internet, you know, internet type thinking versus databases. It's not in a big container. It's in a, a, a namespace and you're, you're looking for specific part numbers and a unique ID tag, which was originally assigned when you did the QIF model. Right, exactly. So yeah, what's not what's not shown here is here's that surface profile that I showed. And if I go back to the unique identifier, you know, this is what it actually looks like there in the code combined with that feature ID um, and this surface profile. So that that summation, if you will, of, of those codes, and I'm not a coder, so I'll just really do poor person poor service to it um but you know you could you can actually go through and find these things within the code that relate to our surface profile and then back on our other page here um you can see that that surface profile here again is captured um and displayed for human readability in this case alongside the results but it's all stored in the data construct <clears throat> So the next question coming up, we have a few more. Um, it, it says, it looks like QIF is an ASCII XML format. 3D point cloud data sets are very large. How can QIF data be incorporated into modern uh, digital streaming protocols like Google protocols uh, buffers? Hmm. Uh, 
So I'm probably gonna have to pass the buck a little bit on this one. Um, there, and, and so, so Ray, feel free to pick it up, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I think the point is, is that first of all, the reason we use XML is because it's an open, it's an open standard, right? And and uh, the data the data sets do do get large, but a lot of times, for example, in this case here, we're really doing the measurement data, not all the point cloud, right? The point cloud still resides. Uh, uh, you're looking at the resultant data, uh, not necessarily the point cloud of a measure capture. Uh, the 3D models, are, uh, uh, the MDF models are good size but then you know what we're trying to do here again is, is we're trying to make it semantically uh, correct so that uh, application to application code can read and interpret uh, the necessary uh, product characteristics to be able to do the the appropriate function right um, qif doesn't actually do the process it it, it is the conduit and the common common storage uh, rules that uh, apply and and so um you know uh, I, I hate to be glib, but storage is relatively cheap, and therefore, you know, being able to use this format it makes transportability and interoperability more viable. Yeah, I th I think that's true, and there's definitely been research projects where they do uh, streaming of um, QIF related results data, um, and combined with MT Connect efforts. So so those there has been definitely. Um, work done in that area using the QAF framework um, okay. and and we definitely are working with MT Connect to um, integrate the the flow of metrology data into um, in, in process manufacturing workflows right hopefully, hopefully that kind of gets to the answer to the question yeah, and again, I'll go back to the other part I was saying. You, you you have to think more like a Google search than a database, right? We are looking for you look for the the qubit, the identifier to associate uh, different, you know, to the original design, and so you're not necessarily parsing the entire uh, uh, pool. You're parsing only the data that's relevant, right? You're looking for the the uh, metadata around the specific part being measured, or the inspection plan, or whatever the uh, part of the QIF uh, wheel you're, you're definitely focused on. Right. I'm going to move on to the next question. How does okay. QIF uh, fit with digital uh, calibration certificate working uh, work being done by uh, the B BIPM and the KDD, uh, excuse me, the DKD? Uh, the, question, the answer is I don't know. Um, and I don't either, so I'll, I'll take that as an action that we'll answer that question <laughs> for somebody, but not, obviously the two yeah. presenters don't have answers. <laughs> yeah, no, but I can say that it did come up. So last summer we did room mapping activity to figure out where we wanted to go strategically with the DMSC for uh, the next stages. Um, for the most part, when it comes to security related questions, we say this is a digital file, encrypt it like you do everything else. Um, obviously, there's nuance to everything, and as you start to extract some of those data elements and get dive deeper, I think there's always going to be work to do to integrate security uh, protocols because they're going to be consistently changing and evolving over time. So, um, I, I would say, Ray, would you agree that it's safe to say we have that on our our long term um, viewpoints where as where part we're of the Yes. So, yeah, it's definitely on our roadmap uh, where we know we need to integrate. Um, I will say today that most people are doing the QIF in production at kind of a desktop level, meaning they aren't like streaming a bunch of data live today. Um, they are passing the data through a, a file, um, you know, out to a supplier through an encrypted channel and that's how they're ensuring the security of the data. Um, so I think there's definitely work upcoming to do to um, consistently incorporate whatever the latest security needs uh, and requirements are in technology, right? Because that's going to constantly change. All right. I think uh, Tom Kramer is responding through a question here. So he says QIF includes binary types for saving large amounts of data. This is the prior question. The data types are part of the XML schema. Uh, 
and the data types are called uh, base 64 binaries. I think that was the earlier question, sorry. Uh, so that's great. Thank you, Tom, for yeah. chiming in. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. I just found it. Um, the next question, any inspection software that are able to read the QIF? Any inspection software that are able to read the QIF? Uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, there are a number of companies that are, are supporting it. Uh, Zeiss supports it. Uh, uh, Mitsutoya supports it. Uh, QVI's um, o OPG and Cotem products support uh, that su support it, and um, our recent uh, member, who is the parent company of Polyworks, uh, is in the process. So there are a number of companies uh, in the marketplace that are either uh, actively have been sh shipping it or are in the process of developing uh, it as a uh, inspection software. Uh, Import or export. Right. Yep. And and we find also like the example in the video that that was Origin International's software checkmate that was reading in the QIF and then exporting to different flavors of Demis, exporting to different um, inspection software uh, to run actually on the hardware. So um, there's so many different things <laughs> to interoperate between. So there's lots of uh, software vendors that are taking that as an opportunity to um, help out. All right. So, so there's a, a question here that's kind of a, a, adjacent to it. It, it says, I see that in earlier charts that you, you're showing Demus as the connector to a, measurement, a measuring machine. Are there any efforts to have the uh, machine, uh, machines consume QIF directly. Um, uh, you know, Demus was a, a, a vendor neutral program. QIF is really intent is to be the the conduit between metrology software. So we assume at this point it, it would be direct consumption by a metrology piece of software, not uh, QIF directly driving a specific machine's uh, motion, for example, or, or scans. Right. Uh, well, and I, I expect, and I don't, I don't know this for sure, but you know, these the machines have already established protocols. So if you know they have established protocols built on Demus, you know that's built in 1986, you know back with Rainbows and the A Team, then you know do they do they alter and change that? I would I would think that'd be a challenging decision to make, and they have to do some mapping, right, of how to control. The, the hardware itself. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and, I did, and, and, I, that's the kind of software programming I did way back in the 90s, but I wasn't very good at it. So that's why I stuck on the design side. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and and again, I think 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 of QIF as more information exchanges, right? In the yes. process de development. Uh, that, that's what, what the vendors who use QIF do uh, as part of the solution for you, the, the user. Um, next question. Uh, we are just starting our journey on QIF. What kind of support do you provide? Uh, provide probably uh, it will come out with a use case, and we would like to have a proof of concept. So right now we offer I, I'm Jennifer, you don't mind. Uh, we offer the the GitHub the GitHub resources. We have uh, resources on our website. Um, we have and and through GitHub we there's a lot of uh, peer uh, peer helping and our experts come through. Uh, there, there's uh, several uh, in you know chat type uh, dialogues. Um, so that's what we currently support. If you have a, a stronger a want or need, we we the DMSC would love to hear uh, what more you would like um, as far as assistance in, in getting started in the in the QIF journey. We we appreciate there's a lot of new members and want to make sure we make the transition from where you are to using QIF as easy as possible. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, the, the next question, does QIF concept by be used in cases uh, case of legacy drawings? Uh, we see our customers having both legacy drawings and also transitioning towards MBD. So, <laughs> uh, you want me to, I'll take that one. Well, yeah, yeah so I, 
so what we do at Action Engineering is we don't write software, we don't build hardware tools for metrology or anything like that. We actually help companies implement um, model-based solutions for their design, fabrication, and inspection activities. So um, this comes up all the time. What do I do with my legacy stuff? Well, you've kind of got two choices and it's not a good answer either way. One is you don't do anything with your legacy data. You leave it alone and let those processes play out. Um, and, and that maybe the hardware goes away over time and is decommissioned. Um, for many industries, that's not a reality. So the second choice is you now convert that drawing based data into what I call 3D data that then can be utilized by these programs. There is no magic button about converting legacy data. If you have something that was built in 1986, a drawing that was built in 1986, or I've actually seen drawings from 1920 um, that are still in operation today, and you know they're they're just horrible replications of original drawn graphics. You have to convert them into digital data. There is no easy button around that. So um, my our recommendation is typically use that kind of, if you're gonna move data from drawings into 3D data, so they can be consumed by these digital thread technologies, um, use it as a training program for your people, because you gotta upskill your people to do this. Drawing, practice, check, you know, the 3D data and have them the run through that loop and have them update that legacy data. Um, neither solution you're gonna be happy with um, from, from a big, that perspective, but it, it, you have to choose one way or the other from a legacy, from dealing with legacy data. Ray, do you have something to add for that? Well, I mean, there are tools that companies do provide that tries to do conversion of two, two, uh, 2D to 3D you know, m models and stuff like that, but the problem is you know, sloppy CAD practices that thinks yeah. it's talking to a human, uh, just don't convert well. There's just no algorithm I can build that can do that, uh, at right. least not yet. So um, there are tools that can help help with the conversion, but you'll never you're never going to get uh, at a high percentage. I mean, your percentages are still you know best is going to be in the 70, 80 percent best case, and you're going to keep stumbling on bad practices or, or things that it just doesn't know how to handle. So right. Um, all right, next question. Uh, the questions are keep coming. You know, I, you, we thought we'd be done by now. Um, what is the adoption of QIF by large OEMs uh, like Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop? What industries are leading the use of QIF? Um, you want me to take a, a stab at that, or yeah, go for it. Know? Yep. So, so there's a lot of a, a lot of the names are, are actively looking, right? We're in this, what I'd say is there, there are, you know, some people in, in production, but few, most people are in the, in the journey of pilot development and, and engaging and working with it. And, and we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, we kind of are a, um, if you think of MBD as the ocean, we're the, a boat rising with the rise of MBD. So as it rises, there's a lot more engagement here and we have a lot more activities and, uh, and so there is a lot of activity with the, the large OEMs uh, going for, you know, forward. Uh, but I would say I don't know anybody who's in end-to-end -end QIF implementation at this point. Right. I think what's going on today at large um, organizations is uh, they are using QIF as a conduit between to their suppliers to get a feedback loop. Um, and one of those, one I'm thinking of in particular um, uses a program called NetInspect, which is also QIF capable to feedback the data into a supply chain dashboard. Um, and so, and that's a, the mix of what's going on there today is um, with NetInspect is, um, combination of QIF data, combination of manually entered uh, inspection data uh, results spanning across the, that dashboard. But that's that's definitely, it's happening. Um, 
and it's providing value, business value today. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is you'll probably always be trying to continuously improve on any digital automation that you put in place. So the key to getting there, in quotes, is, is to do it in a stepwise fashion um, and make sure you're gaining business value uh, at every step of the way so that you are um, realizing the return on your investment of tools, processes, standards, upskilling of people, um, realizing those benefits within a relatively short time frame, as opposed to trying to amortize that over 10 years. Okay, and so the next question, uh, since QF uh, model generators do not appear to be free, does it mean that a plugin is needed to read and write out in every step of manufacturing? Um, it no. depends, <laughs> I think is the answer. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you do have to purchase translation software like you do um, for everything to translate from one format, file format to another. That's how those interoperability software vendors make their money uh, is to provide you with that service um, and that capability. Uh, so, as as far as the manufacturing steps go, it kind of depends on: Are you in SolidWorks the whole time? Are you going from Creo to SolidWorks to NX? Because that happens. Um, you know what what does it look like, and how do you minimize those exchange of phone bucks? And and the reason I was saying though is that once you derived a, a CAD to a, a QIF MVD or a step MVD. Um, then if, if you have uh, QIF enabled application software in, in your CAM or in your inspection, mm -hmm. then it can import those, those, that file. So once the, the derivative model is created, right, as long as there's a, the application uh, use cases in manufacturing or, or inspection have QIF import export, they can ingest the model as is. But you're right to the, uh, I think we're both right on that. Yeah, right. So, um, all right, here, here's a, there's two more. I, I'm gonna, oh, there's a lot more. Sorry, I didn't scroll far enough. Do you know any model-based tolerance stack up tools with QIF uh, format? Um, does Codem do stack up analysis? Uh, a very rudimentary. Um, I, I think he's talk, what he's talking about is, um, I mean, the, the closest I would think is, is symmetrics, right? Uh, the, their, uh, yeah, software. and that works with the native software. Um, it, it's not necessarily so it's not interoperating yet. with QIF. Yeah, yeah. yeah not uh, to my knowledge. Um, yeah, I, I would say that I, I don't, I'm not official. I, I, we, there's nobody that I'm aware of that has it available today. I agree. I agree. Uh, <clears throat> All right, next question, does, does QIF also uh, be consumed by uh, MES systems in the feedback loop established mm -hmm. at a shop floor level? Uh, no, but I, I think everybody wishes that it did. Right. Um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. There is definitely research afoot to, to go down that line. Um, it's just not mature yet, um, but, but definitely, the need for in-process inspection during the actual fabrication process and, and feeding into the real-time loops and um, optimizing machine tool performance um, is a great opportunity and is definitely um, on the roadmap to investigate those scenarios and what opportunity could be gleaned. And the second question from the same gentleman, how, how do I also consume the QIF strengths and integrate with other quality manufacturing related inspection processes like uh, PFMEA or control plants? Which also, is a perfect I'm segue to our, our, our work group. I'm to show up for my uh, strategy working group. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, those are all really important um, upcoming activities that we hope to um, start working on. Right. 
we, we're actively in, in investigation of that. And so, Absolutely. And, and, and if you're interested, please reach out to us because we always are looking for member members or, or people to participate in these uh, pro work group projects. But definitely those items are on the strategy side of things rather than active working groups right. today. Um, so they're not, Right. I would say they're not underway, but they're on the list of things to work on. Um, and I have on my action item list to, uh, we're going to kick off official working group meetings for this strategy, um, st strategic working group for the DMSC. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to call this the last question. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm not, but you are not required to use QIF MVD, correct? You can use STEP, for example. Uh, required by who? Uh, I think it just, I think that was a general yeah. question. Is QIF, is the QIF um, MBD the only solution or can we, could there be other solutions for derivative models? I'll give my answer because, uh, and I'll give my answer not as a DMSC board member, but as action engineering. Um, you can, we've tested both. Uh, step is clunky, QIF is not. Um, QIF was specifically built to for metrology data. Um, Step's primary uh, method was for long-term archival and retrieval. And so the data construct is a little clunkier um, than the QIF one, which is simpler. So both are feasible pathways. Um, we just see that the step side of the house is harder to implement and adopt for metrology and from the dmsc standpoint we support either qif course or or step right i mean we're we're, right. we're a vendor neutral organization yeah and and there is that's that's what iso asked us to do when they harvested qif 3.0 was to map step and qif and see where the gaps are so that work has like i said is underway it's very complex um and uh, but but that that's you know that's part of the activities that that ISO wanted to see done because of course ISO um, is a big supporter of stuff as well. They're all they're all good file formats. Use the ones that give you the most business value, or use both. I, there was one more question that snuck in. Um, I think I can answer it, but let me let me put it out there. How does QIF ensure the quality of measurements and the decision rules for pass fail of a of, of a dimension dimension? And the answer is it doesn't. That's what the metrology software does. Uh, it, we have an inspection plan that can be transported. You can have a results, but uh, the rules, the compliancy is really part of what Zeiss would generate or what uh, Mitsutoya's software would do. Uh, and those things get, um, the, the measurement rules get put in and they have to do the metrology magic and then the measurement results can come out in back into QIF. Uh, we're not doing the integrity of the actual rules. Those That mathematics is done in, in the uh, specific software, inspection software. And I think that concludes today's uh, questions. I, I think I got everybody. If I didn't, please uh, let me know or you can send me another message while I'll leave this open for a while. I just want to remind everybody that um, our next meet, our next uh, text, uh, uh, coffee chat session is May 25th at 11 Eastern time. And this will be uh, advanced MBD with QIF. That will be CapVidia and Snyder Elect Elect Electric's uh, long-term vision. Uh, as you know, uh, just just and if you want to register, go to uh, the Q, the QIF standards with an S dot org and go to events and you can register for the upcoming um, May 25th. And that concludes today's presentation. I hope you all have a great day and take care. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.